to today's webinar which with sharing expert tips and gear for winter cycling. My name is Julie Quinn and joining me today to facilitate today's webinar are my colleagues Kelly Marsacci and Sophia Gallimore. This webinar is brought to you by Transaction Associates. We are a full service transportation company managing TMAs, assisting clients with commuting options, commuter benefits and promoting green commutes. Hard to believe we are in November, and with that comes colder weather, usually. So our cycling has to shift gears. Today, you will hear about expert winter biking tips from Mass Bike, bike buying ideas from Urban Adventures Bike Shop, and AAA bicycle roadside assistance. So let's meet our guest speakers. First, we have Galen Mook, who is the executive director of Mass Bike, your statewide bicycle advocacy organization. Though he works in a lot of broad issues such as policies, legislation, funding concerns, education, and more, Galen's especially enjoys working on breaking down barriers to biking while encouraging people to bike more. Jeff Tam is from Urban Adventures, Boston Cycling Outfitters, offering, offering bike tours, rentals, and a full service bike shop. Jeff loves her riding bikes, started at a very young age, and having worked for a bike share company in Los Angeles, California, Jeff is determined to get more people onto bikes. And we have Ron Esposito from AAA. He's a retired lieutenant of the Union County Police Department located in Westfield, New Jersey. He's been a traffic safety specialist for the past seven years for AAA Northeast and is also a League of American Bicyclist Cycling Instructor. We welcome your questions for each and all of our panelists today, and then we ask that you use the questions panel on the right hand side of your screen to submit your questions. After the three panelists finish, we'll ask them to answer your questions that you have submitted. So we're gonna start off with Galen, and before we start off with Galen, we have our first poll. If you guys wanna participate, please do. Kelly will launch that poll for you. Go ahead, Kel. Absolutely. So just a quick kind of, you know, kind of see who's on the call. Uh, do you bike year round? Yes, no, I'd like to, but I need help preparing. So kind of get an overall sense of how you guys are biking. So I'll leave this poll open for about 30 seconds or so. We're about halfway there. So if you haven't gotten your vote in, go ahead and do that now. Okay. We're going to go ahead and close the poll. And here we go. So we got a three-way tie. Wow. Uh, okay. Yes, some of you bike all year round, and some of you don't, and some of you need a little bit of help uh, preparing for that. So go ahead, Galen. Excellent. Okay, yeah. well, with that, I will turn it over to Galen, all you, and you can tell people how they can prepare. Awesome. Let me just pull up my screen. Can you hear me and see this title screen okay? Yes. Looks good. Excellent. Cool. Good. I can no longer see you. So if there's something that is a snag, feel free to jump right on in. Um, this is going to be a quick uh, overview of some bike commuting tips for riding in the winter. Uh, we also have uh, some other experts to follow up with this. So I'm going to breeze through a bunch of slides, but I can dive deeper in the Q&A as needed. I just want to hit some high level tips so that we're all uh, kind of in the same awareness as to some considerations, which do pertain to warm and fair weather, but also are extra specific for winter riding. Um, first off, just encouraging you to ride in the winter and to think about even if there's a little bit of snow on the ground, there are plenty of ways that you can modify your ride, your bike, your route to still go riding. And some of the most beautiful time to ride, as long as you're equipped, is going out and riding out there in the snow. Highly encourage it. And for those of you who were around last week and actually got the four or five inches in the Boston area, um, you'll have to understand, even though it's 65 degrees outside today, um, it's coming fast. Um, why are we going by a bike? Um, actually, this is the slide I wanted to get to. Um, there's three barriers to focus on that I want you to keep in mind for overcoming um, the limitations to riding in the winter. Basically, it's darkness, which can be overcome by reflectivity and lighting up your bike. Uh, temperature, which can be overcome by layering system and understanding how your body's metabolism works and having a proper plan for layers to either disrobe or add layers as needed. And then ice and snow. And ice and snow is a big barrier in terms of how uh, much traction you have when you're out there, what routes you're going to choose to ride on. And uh, I also want to throw in this Calvin and Hobbes clip because I'm a big fan of Calvin and Hobbes. And uh, I always appreciated that the dad was an avid cyclist who always did made fun of by the family. So just to keep in mind that uh, though there are some barriers to overcome, it's still completely possible to go out and ride no problem. 
I'm gonna touch briefly on the bikes, but I know that Jeff from Urban Event Tours will go into more detail. But just so you understand that there's a different variety of bikes uh, that can be modified for the winter, it's a spectrum. But I will, just so we're on a similar terminology, commuter bikes are typically the same upright bikes that you see people riding around the city. Good for going just a few miles, nothing too intensive. They're heavier, but that means that they're equipped for fenders or racks or carrying capacity, made for short trips. Um, you could do road biking in the winter. Uh, just keep in mind that the traction might be a little iffy if you have snow and ice out there. But these are made for longer distance. They're lighter weight bikes, uh, different body geometry. You'll see that the rider's more hunched over. The same considerations for fair weather to winter riding for road biking. Um, mountain bikes are kind of a great tool for pivoting your bike and modifying your bike to suit winter conditions, which again, Jeff will touch briefly on, um, and I'll talk about this bike shortly, but this is actually Sheldon Brown's personal bike. He was kind of the bike repair, bike maintenance guru from West Newton who has this trove of bike mechanic tips. Um, and we'll talk about Sheldon's bike in a second. Um, there are certain modifications that he did to make his mountain bike snow specific. Uh, folding bikes, they're also great options because you can be multimodal with them. You can take them on the green line, you can take them on a bus. You know, if you're wearing your winter gear, that's great. But then, you know, if you want to put the folding bike in the trunk of a car um, or just want to do a one way trip, folding bikes, um, there's no limitations as to how you can take them on the trains or buses. It just makes that much more, uh, that makes being multimodal that much more accessible. Uh, fat tire bikes are also a relatively new development in the biking industry, but these are hugely popular. They're really fun to ride regardless of the condition, but these actually ride on top of the snow and ice more so than dig into the snow and ice. And they have such wide tires that they have good traction out there. So they're good for mountain biking, but they're also good, and they're good for riding on sand if you want to go to the beach, but they're also really great for riding in the snow just the same. Um, and some considerations about what you might want to do in order to make your bike a little bit more winter friendly. This is a very dense slide. I'm not going to get into everything, but the big things you might want to think about modifying and converting your bike into a wet weather bike, we call it, or basically a winter bike. You might want to think about getting wider tires as much as your wheels can withstand, so they have knobs on them. You might want to think about getting fenders to keep the snow and salt from getting splashed around. Um, you might want to think about getting different pedals that modify, or that can be modified for your boots. So maybe broader pedals so that if you're riding in snow boots, galoshes or other rain gear that you'll have traction um, from your feet. And then if you want to think about, you know, getting studded tires, you can actually get tires that like car drivers have with little studs in it. Um, you can also get bikes that are disc brakes and different modifications. But um, one thing I'll bring back to this bike, a couple of things that I like about Sheldon Brown's bike. Um, one is that he modified the bike to make it a single speed, which means that there's the whole gear system in the rear has been taken off and it's just one gear. Can't change the gear, but that means that there's less to um, clean, less to get broken. And I guarantee you the cable systems of a bike get uh, corroded through the sand and salt that you're riding through. The gear shifter systems get corroded. So by removing that, that's a, a great um, benefit to having a winter bike. You'll see that's bright yellow. So it's very noticeable when you're out there in the winter time, which gets the visibility. There's fenders. It's an upright bike, so the handlebars kind of have a very flat bar system, a very simple machine. And my hunch is that this is actually a fixed gear. That means that he can actually brake when he's riding by pedaling backwards, which um, will in an attempt to stop the rear wheel. There's a lot that we can talk about about modifying a bike, but just want to throw this one out here as a good example, um, which if there are questions about it, I'm sure Jeff will answer and we could also touch on the Q&A. But keep in mind, you might need to modify your bike in order to have it fit the winter season. Um, some things to carry. You'll think a little bit more about the necessities, especially uh, if you're going to be out on longer rides that take you out of the city. Um, I'd recommend carrying chapstick, extra rags, things that can be used to clean off the rims if you have rim brakes so that the brakes can function, things that can be used to kind of wipe down the chain in case it gets all clogged if you are riding in the sleet and snow. You don't have to go that far. You can always just ride in the cold and be fine. But if you do choose to ride in the, the wet weather, there's extra considerations about just bringing some um, simple cleaning supplies to clean off your bike. Definitely would recommend if you're going to be a, changing a tire out there in the wild that you don't rely on a patch kit. Um, patches don't necessarily work so well in the wet weather or in the cold weather. If you're good at it, great. I'm like a four out of 10 um, uh, success rate when I'm patching my tubes. So if I ever get a flat tire out there, 
I generally just bring an extra tube um, and some know-how and how to change it. Um, and some uh, bike lubricant also can go a long way, especially if you're riding in the cold, cold weather. Um, if there's any water in the cabling system or there's uh, like a, a hitch in the shifting, a little bit of chain lubrication um, on those components will actually go a long, long way. Um, you're going to want to combat the darkness. And for my answer here of how bright do I think is bright enough, there's no limitation as to how much you can brighten your bike. So at least a front light and a rear light, but definitely I would also recommend lights on the sides. I would recommend reflectivity. Just be as bright as possible. Over communicate what you're about to do and being visible through lightness. Um, because we all know that come middle of December, the sun starts to set around 3.30, which is a sad reality. But, you know, it's just true that the only way to get around that is to be bright. So think about how, how many lights are being seen um, by others, but then also having enough light that you can see what you're on as well. There's kind of two different ways to philosophize around lighting systems for being seen and then also seeing. Maintenance is an extra special uh, challenge in the winter because you're gonna need to do your due diligence of wiping down your chain. You're gonna need your due diligence of cleaning off the rims. Um, some people I might recommend if you're gonna ride in the slush and be a regular commuter, you might wanna wipe down your bike almost like once you are, have arrived at your destination, especially if you're gonna bring your bike indoors, give it a good brush down. Um, the basics that are gonna uh, reinforce that we've talked about on other webinars are the air, the brakes, and the chain which you can go back and see how we did our whole 90 minutes on pumping the tires and tightening the brake cables with the barrel adjusters and um, cleaning the chain. That's a year round consideration, but particularly for the winter, you're gonna need to be extra vigilant about avoiding the rust. The best way to avoid the rust is to make sure that the sand and the salt that is on your chain system doesn't stay on your chain system for a long period of time, which means wiping it down, um, my recommendations might even be like if you have the wherewithal to uh, maybe if you come home after your commute in the day, you have like a watering can with warm water. You just kind of like wash off the, uh, the where the gears and the chain are just as a little bit or just take a brush like a small hand brush and wipe down some of that collected sand and salt that's in the slush. If you're choosing to ride in the salt and sand, you don't have to, um, but you'll see in that bottom picture of the blue bike. A lot of the slush collects right in what's called the down tube, where there's a lot of moving gears and moving parts. In prior webinars, we talked about the importance of cleaning your chain with lubrication. I wanna remind you that WD-40 is not a lubricant. WD-40 will help remove rust, but you should probably think about getting a bike-specific lubricant. Um, there's different varieties. There's wet lubricant, which is thicker and lasts longer. There's dry lubricant, which is more thin. It kind of feels more like olive oil, but has to be reapplied more regularly. There's wax lubricant, which actually stays a lot longer, but you have to have a clean base. But there's a lot of considerations that uh, a bike shop like Urban Adventurers can talk about, um, or maybe even one-on-one -on -one you bring your bike in. But just keep in mind, maintenance is gonna be absolutely key for making sure that you keep your chain lubricated and uh, making sure that the moving metal doesn't necessarily get all rusted up because there is a lot of salt that gets thrown around by the salt trucks. There's a lot of sand that gets thrown around by the sand trucks, um, and both of those things will destroy your componentry, which is also why I recommend thinking about a whole other bike of a wet bike if you want to go so far. Um, clothing is also very important. This is basically my rule of layers. There's no such thing as bad weather in New England. It's just bad clothing. Everybody is a little bit different. Everybody is a little particular, but my main suggestion is to plan where you will be 10 minutes into your ride. It's actually a lot easier to overheat in the winter than actually be cold. So depending on the weather, um, you know, and we know the temperature can swing 20 or 30 degrees in a day. So knowing the forecast as well, but being able to layer different um, stratas and being able to disrobe will actually make your ride that much happier. I recommend like if you're a camper or a hiker, uh, people who do backcountry hiking, the same basic principle of cotton is not your friend. You wanna start with a wicking base to get the moisture away from your body. Then second layer would kind of be an insulation layer, um, something like a thin uh, trousers, a thin uh, turtleneck. Then you can do a, a warming layer of scarf, 
of real sweaters. If you want to go that far, that might be as far as you need to go in most weather. But if you want to go so far as to get like the full on winter gear, if you're a skier, if you're a snowboarder, if you're a hiker, same principles that you would do to going out in the uh, winter time there, totally apply for cycling. It's just that keep in mind that you are going to be burning a lot of calories and you're going to want to have a uh, gear that you can have breathability. So sometimes there's zippers in the armpits. Sometimes it's uh, disrobing and taking off an outer layer so that you can become more breathable. But keep in mind that it's an awareness thing of how warm are you and then kind of pair it back from there. I also recommend a very strong, a uh, very good quality outer layer for keeping the wet weather off. So the same thing you would wear in the rain, um, just a shell that is waterproof can be layered under. So it could be for warm weather, the same rain gear can be used in cold weather if you're layering under it for insulation purposes. But if you're gonna be riding in the snow, which is totally feasible, you're gonna to need to basically think like, oh, what's my rain gear? And then use that. And then to also know that your outermost gear needs to be reflective, needs to be bright and be visible. Doesn't matter if your inner gears are nice and neon, it's that final layer. So if you have a darker coat that you're gonna wear for a winter coat, think about getting a exterior vest or think about getting something retro reflective to put over that final layer so that you are bright. A um, Couple more slides and then I'll pass it off because I know that we've got a lot to cover today. Um, cleaning up before work, once you arrive, I recommend a couple of tips if you are gonna be a winter commuter. Arrive early, give yourself some time so that you can cool down, especially if you're a warm-blooded rider like I am, I, I heat up quite a bit. You might wanna have a change of clothes at work so that if things get a little bit wet, you're totally fine, you can just, you know, switch into something else or you got some backup. Um, baby wipes, if you don't have a shower, are also really nifty to kind of just clean yourself off. Um, and then, you know, give it some practice. Do a ride in on a day where you don't have a stressful meeting or a time deadline so you can give yourself a little bit of buffer. Um, and I'm happy to answer more for the Q&A. Um, locking up, the be all end all here is don't lock up outside if you can help it. If you can really put your bike in an indoor cage, that's key to making sure it doesn't get plowed in and doesn't get covered in uh, the, the, the sand and salt that's being sprayed out there by the sand trucks. And keep in mind that your normal bike parking might disappear a little bit in the winter time as well, based off the snowbank situation. Um, we talked about multimodal commuting a little bit with the folding bikes, but think about combining your trips with the MBTA. Happy to answer some more questions on that. Uh, you can go to mbta.com slash bikes if you have any questions about how to integrate your trips. And I also know that Transaction runs a bunch of shuttle services. I don't know if they have bike capacity, but that's something to check in on and do a little bit of advanced research. But being multimodal is a key way to making sure that if the weather changes on you, you have a backup plan. And I'm sure that Sophia can talk a little bit about the benefits that the TMA provides in terms of a ride home and some other uh, considerations for you. Um, and then my last couple slides, a little bit about technique. Your technique will change when you're biking. I'm gonna hold off on going too deep into this unless there's a real Q&A around it. But my real um, tip for you is practice. Find yourself in a parking lot on a snowy day, slipping and sliding and gaining your momentum and getting back into it. Just be ready to slip a little bit, it's okay. If we were in person, I would ask everybody who has slipped in the wintertime walking to raise your hand. Everybody who has slipped in the wintertime, if they've been driving, to raise your hand. So just be ready for a little bit of slipperiness. But even more so, I want you to keep in mind the driver's perspective if you're out there. If you're gonna be choosing to ride in the streets, keep in mind that driver visibility is way limited and you might not necessarily be aware of it. So I'm gonna leave this slide up for just about 30 seconds to give you an opinion, or uh, give you a perspective from behind the driver's sight. And to keep in mind that even in the road, the car lights are on. So you might want to think about having daytime running lights for your bicycle. Um, you're going to think about, oh, you're probably going to ride more in the center of the lane because the bike lane will be plowed in. And just keep in mind that your routing will change based off the plowing. And um, if you don't want to ride in this condition, that's totally fine. Usually around here, winter time doesn't really settle in until later January. Anyway, you can ride up through then if you're just dealing with the darkness and the cold. But if you do want to start to deal with the slush and the snow, just be very extra empathetic that drivers are limited in what they're able to do as well. So don't take any chances, just go slower. 
And with that, um, I think I'll leave it and send it back over to the rest of my team. And of course, we'll stick around for Q&A. So um, thank you for letting me go off on that pretty quick um, ramble there. And with that, I'll give it up to Jeff and Ron. You did excellent. Thank you, Galen. Thank you. That's, I, it, I know it's a lot to cover for winter biking. There's so many things that you could do, need. Um, and yes, I was raising my hand for slipping on biking, walking, driving, all of that. So, although you couldn't see it. Um, so thank you. And um, everyone, just a reminder, put your questions in the questions bar. After we finish with the three presentations, we will go ahead and answer the questions. Um, so if you have anything for Galen, put it in there. We'll make sure that we ask him. So thank you. Um, we are going to go up next will be Jeff Tam, who again is from Urban Adventors there in the North End, um, Boston's bike shop. And again, before we start with Jeff, we've got a poll um, that Kelly's gonna launch just to see what we've got going on. Go ahead, Kel. Absolutely. So before Jeff speaks, just you know, kind of what are you in the market for? Uh, check all that interests you. So talking about winter bikes, talking about lights, tires, bags, panniers, uh, and apparel. I hope I said that word last right. <laughs> so go ahead and get those votes in. Again, we'll leave this open for about 30 seconds or so. Looks like we're about 60% of the votes are in. So if you haven't gotten your votes in yet, go ahead and just check all that are interesting to you. Okay. <clears throat> Looks like we got a lot of votes in, so we're going to go ahead and close the poll and share these results. So it looks like 44 for both, 44% uh, I should say, for winter bikes and lights, uh, a lot of interest in apparel, and then tires, and then finally bags. So take it away, Jeff. Cool. All right. Everyone can hear me? Thanks, Jeff. Great. Um, all right, so yeah, I'm Jeff. I'm the uh, general manager at Urban Event Tours. Uh, as uh, Kelly mentioned, we are located in North End at 109 Atlantic Ave. So that's just right across the Christopher Columbus Park, um, around the corner from the aquarium. Um, uh, we are a full cycling outfitter. So we offer sales, service, rentals, and bike tours. And so no matter if you're local or you have friends or family in town, we can definitely help you and be a local bike shop. Now we do bike tours. We've done charity rides. We've helped transaction with a lot of mobile mechanic events. And um, also we're a full service shop with uh, lots of good winter commuting stuff um, to sell. So a little about um, our shop. Um, so like car dealerships, bike shops are dealers of specific bike brands. Um, at Urban Cycles, we carry specialized Giant, Kona, Scott, and Beria bikes. Um, today I'm going to showcase you um, probably the most five most common bikes um, you see. But you know, there's a lot of other bikes that I'm not going to show you today that uh, Galen did mention in this presentation. But I'm going to just set up my camera real quick for you all. So we're going to start off by looking at this bike, which is a hybrid bike, um, as Galen called it in his presentation, a commuter bike. Um, so you see it right here behind me. It's got a flat handlebar. Um, rigid, so there's no suspension in it. Uh, it's also commonly known as a hybrid bike or a city bike. Um, these bikes are probably the most common bikes you see around. Um, they're versatile, they are relaxed, comfortable riding, and they have a lot of um, support for fenders that you see on this bike, the green fenders. You have some on the back, and then you can also add racks onto this bike. So as um, Galen mentioned, uh, there's a lot of winter commuting options with fenders that help keep the slush off your uh, back, keep you clean. Um, you can get fenders to attach a basket to it, or you can put panniers on it so you can keep the weight off your back and keep it on your bike. Um, but the hybrid bike is probably the most common bike um, you will see around on the streets. So let me just get that up real quick. So the next bike we have is a road bike. There are many styles of road bike, but generally speaking, they will all look like this um, with a drop handle bar, so that curves down. Um, as uh, Dale mentioned, these are usually you no know, lighter, faster, more high performance bikes. They um, provide different riding positions for you from up here to your hoods or down here. So on those long rides, you can switch up your riding position and have less pressure, uh, stress on your back. So these bikes, you know, they are usually higher end, cost a little more, um, but 
you know, there is a lot of different road bikes in the sense of there's gravel bikes, cross bikes. So there's just as many on-road road bikes as there are off-road road bikes. Um, but this is one from my coworker, as you see, um, he has been riding through the winter, especially last week. There's lots of grime on it, lots of dirt. So the fenders and all that, this is where it plays a part in the uh, order bike. Next type of bike I'm gonna talk about is a mountain bike. So this bike right here, as you see, um, is a full suspension mountain bike. This is probably a common bike that most of all of us grew up riding as a kid. You know, uh, mountain bikes were very popular um, in the past in the 80s, 90s, where you just see one suspension in the front and usually a rigid frame in the back. So old school like Gary Fishers, you know, Diamondbacks and all those. Um, Usually in the past, they've always just kind of uh, man, uh, produced mountain bikes. Uh, hybrid bikes have been more of a thing in recent years. Um, but this is a uh, full suspension mountain bike. So you see uh, rear shock here, front shock here, wide tires, but mainly a bike that's uh, designed to perform in the off roads. So, you know, it can be ridden in the snow a little, but mainly more for dirt in the woods and the forest and all that stuff. Um, looking forward to talk about these bikes. So this is an electric bike. Um, it's pretty sleek. They are heavy. It's probably 30 plus pounds. It's got a battery hidden in here. But the idea um, of these bikes are that um, they just give you a little more power, a little more distance in your riding. And for people who are a little more physically, um, in, like who have some physical restraints, these bikes will really help you out. So you know, the pedal assist bike will help you get up hills, fight the wind. And uh, this is the type of bike that has been on the rise the past like three to five years. A very recent technology, um, but usually when you're riding electric bikes, um, you know, a lot of elderly like to use them or people with their commutes of you know, 10 plus miles, electric bikes um, come in very uh, handy. Last but not least, <laughs> this fat bike. So Galen showed a picture of it. Um, as you see, it's got very wide tires. Um, these are basically like 3.0 or 4.0 tires. So um, very similar to a mountain bike, as you can see, but the difference is that extra wide tires. So um, these tires, you know, mainly are great for snow. Riding on the sand is also um, will perform well on that. Um, but they're a lot slower, but very comfortable. So uh, Galen did mention that, you know, this is a snow snow bike or so, but there's really two spots of uh, riding in the winter. So you can go wider tires, which allow you to ride over snow, um, providing more comfort, more handling. Um, but you, there's also another school of thought where you ride skinny tires where it drives into the snow. So like skinny tires, like a 23 millimeter, or like a road bike tire. People, you know, I personally, when I first moved here from California, I was a little freaked out by riding skinny tires, but now I've learned, you know, it's just a different school of thought and it works just as well. Um, with snow, skinny or wide, it's both fine. It's really your riding uh, ability and style. And just you gotta be extra careful. But when it comes to ice, um, neither tire is gonna perform like well at that. Ice is something that you just gotta be on the lookout and just um, be careful about. Those are just five quick type of bikes to show you. But you know, there's a lot of other bikes um, out there, such as cargo bikes, uh, trikes folding bikes, single speed bikes, um, hand cycles, all of these are different bikes types. Um, and you no, know, every bike for every person is different. Um, it really just depends your needs from it. Um, last thing I wanna to touch base on is just the pandemic and the bike boom that it has caused. So I don't know if you've heard of you've gone to a bike shop recently, but there has been a bike shortage and part shortage in our industry. Um, because of the bike boom, a lot of people don't want to take the public transportation anymore. 
And also a lot of people don't have gym access, so they're trying to exercise on the bike. So since about March to April and the bike industry in our shop, we've literally sold out of every single bike. Um, every, like I'd say entry level bike, sub thousand to two thousand dollar bikes have been sold so right now um mixed with the supply chain issue um in china and all the all that um a lot of our vendors are even having issues um manufacturing all these products for us to sell so um my biggest uh tip for if you're looking for bikes or products and all that is to be patient um find the right bike for yourself don't rush into it but realistically speaking probably the shortage in bike parts and um, bikes will last about until at least spring 2021. So if you're in the market for a bike right now, um, you will have limited options, but like I said, just be patient. Um, there is definitely a bike out there for you and just don't rush into anything. Um, I'll probably save more of the questions on uh, for later during Q&A, but that is about it for me. All right. Wonderful, Jeff. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeff. That was awesome. Um, we do have a couple of audience questions that have come in, but we'll wait till the end and we'll um, ask you to answer those. Those are great. Um, it's amazing um, the amount of bikes that are actually out there that you can buy. And I do know that there's been a shortage um, because everyone wants to ride, um, mm -hmm. which is a good thing for us, um, for those of us who love biking. Um, so now we're going to go to Ron Esposito, who's from AAA. Um, and not to be left out before Ron's presentation, we have a poll to, for you guys to answer um, with that. So, Cal, yep. easy one. Yep, very easy. Are you a AAA member? Yes or no? So, again, we'll leave this open for about 30 seconds. Uh, make sure everyone gets their votes in, and then we'll hear from Ron. Okay, looks like we got a couple more votes we're waiting on. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close the poll. We got all our votes in. Look at you guys. So yeah, we have okay. sixty percent of you ha are not a AAA member, and then forty percent of you are. So go ahead, Ron. Okay. Here you go, all you. All right, share my screen, and it's not coming up. How nope, come? it looks great. We can see your presentation. Oh, you can. Okay. Yep. I can't see it. <laughs> so, well, that's, uh, not good. That, that's not good. Hold on. Um, nope. Why am I not seeing it? Because I can't speak up. I can't see it. Do you see your mouse? Yeah, I do see my mouse. Hmm. I was going to say, we can, we can see your mouse kind of hovering over the presentation itself. Yeah, but I can't see the presentation. I don't know, know what happened here. Um, mm -hmm. Try. Yep. Okay. Still, I still don't see it, Ron? No. Um, there it is. You. Okay. I got it Perfect. now. All right. Uh, so my name is Ron Esposito. I, I'm also a... Uh, Defensive driving instructor. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about defensive uh, biking in the winter and, and special things to look for. Uh, so first off, uh, in defensive bicycling, you want to prepare for your trip. You want to plan your route. Uh, as uh, Dan said earlier, that uh, you know you you may change your route depending on whether roads are snow covered or not. Take more main drags that you know will be plowed. And an important part is to notify somebody of your trip details and and arrival time so that if you don't show up uh, they'll know that you're missing a quick bike inspection before every ride of course our abcs we all know that uh now i have a tip that i got from a friend of mine uh wd-40 as bicyclists we we're told never use wd-40 but in this case for winter especially when you're going to have snow and such if you take wd-40 and spray it onto the frame and wipe it down it makes a nice slick surface for the snow to fall off of and makes spraying it off afterwards very easy. Stay as visible as possible. We talked about having lights front and back, side on the wheels, using bright clothing, reflective materials. Uh, and our position on the roadway is very important. If we're, if we're riding uh, in an area that 
people are not going to be able to see because of snow collecting. We want to be out in the middle of the roadway to increase that angle so that we can be seen so sooner. Uh, in defense of bicycling, we want to me minimize our risk. So we always give the right away to another vehicle uh, or pedestrian that has the right away. And we never take the right away unless it's being given to us. And we want to make eye contact and make sure that person either in the, in the vehicle or the pedestrian sees us and kind of uh, knows that we're there. And we want to signal and let them know what our intentions are. Make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page and slow down. Uh, you know, I, I also ride a, a motorcycle and I was taught this when I was very, very young. Coming to a green light, I slow down and I look both ways and I don't cross into that green unless I know that I have a freeway through. And the same can be said for bicycle. Road conditions can play a big part in our speed, our position in the roadway, and whether we're actually gonna ride or not. If there's a lot of black ice and a lot of uh, wet ice, melting ice, uh, that is super, super, super slick and it, and it can be very difficult to ride at all. Uh, but for the most part, pavement, rain, even snow, uh, uh, not a big problem. Of course, gravel and dirt, and you've all seen the different bikes that, that you'd be able to use uh, for those different conditions. Winter speed and positioning. Well, in general, if there is something in the roadway like rain, snow, or sleet, or ice, or any of those things, we are going to slow down quite a bit. Uh, when navigating intersections, we want to make sure that we come out. We have to come out into the roadway and make sure that the people in the intersections or maybe crossing in front of us see us and know that we're coming. Uh, if there are snow banks, we may want to approach, approach those snow banks, get around them, and maybe even come to a stop before we enter the intersection and make sure that everybody knows that we're entering. Uh, door zones, which um, we haven't talked about yet today, uh, very, very, very dangerous thing. Uh, people get in and out of their cars without looking all the time. Uh, Wintertime does not change that. Uh, the thing is, is that it's going to be darker, so they even have a less chance of seeing you. So we want to stay at least five feet away from any vehicles that are parked on the roadway. And if there are vehicles that are parked in snow banks that they've dug out a little cubby, we've all seen that. They get their car in that cubby and then they pull it out and put up a garbage can to block it so nobody takes it. Uh, the, you know, they can pull out of there uh, very, very quickly without seeing you. And uh, as uh, was said earlier, you know, we can't make fast, quick, evasive maneuvers because we don't have the traction. So again, move out from the side of the roadway, get out into the middle of the road, take the road. That's what we need to do. Uh, some signs of uh, vehicles that may be pulling onto the roadway. If you see the exhaust fumes coming out of the vehicle, when the vehicle's cold, usually those are very, very smoky, very bright. And it could be a clue as to, hey, this guy's gonna pull out. So we slow down, take our time, move out to the left. If you're out there and you're having some fun and boom, you get a flat tire and you don't have a tube or, you, or, or your chain breaks or a myriad of different things and you need uh, some roadside assistance. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if everybody knows this. If you are a AAA uh, Northeast member, included in your membership is 24 hour roadside service. Uh, you don't have to do anything special. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to click, I want to have bicycle service. It's automatically there. All you would do is call the normal number on the back of your card and you get two free bicycle services per year. Uh, we'll pick you up on any main roadway. We, of course, we're not gonna go into trails and that type of thing. You'll have to walk the bike out. Uh, and we can transport you and your bicycle up to 10 miles. If you go past the 10 miles for the transportation, there a mileage curve, uh, uh, a mileage fee will incur. Um, there's a couple uh, uh, restrictions. You have to be a AAA Northeast current member. Uh, if you're a AAA member from out of our area, uh, the bike service is not offered. Uh, you must have your ID card. A lot of people have the app and has the ID card on it. Uh, that would be fine, but you have to have some kind of ID on you also, driver's license, uh, or something else to show that you are the person who has the uh, service. Two-wheel bicycles only, um, has to fit on a standard bike rack. 
no tandem bicycles are allowed. Uh, it cannot be used uh, to take a bike from your home to a repair shop. Uh, it must be while you're out riding. Services provided for bicyclists and accompanying minors only, meaning if you're in a group of five people and there's one minor with you, we'll take you and that minor and the bike to where you need to go. The other uh, riders will not be allowed to join in on the ride. All right, service calls for a minor can be made by a legal guardian who has a membership and you do not have to be with a minor at the time. Although I'm sure most people if uh, your daughter or son uh, breaks down and needs a ride, you're gonna try to get out there to help them. But it is there in case you need it. And finally, uh, bicycle service calls, those two extra calls, you can't, be, you can't use any of those calls to tow a vehicle or fix a flat or uh, replace a battery for your vehicle. They're for bicycles only. So uh, the next thing I hear, have here is a little video that I found just to show how much fun that you could have out there biking in the snow. Now, this guy is from Helsinki, Finland, and he looks like he's having the best time ever. Usually, there's music uh, that goes along with this, but I couldn't, we couldn't get that to work. So where did you find this video, Ron? This is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. If you if you uh, search uh, winter biking in Helsinki, this will be the first one that comes up. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's having a lot of fun. It gives me anxiety, but I know people can do it. You have to be very confident in your bodily abilities, I think. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know you guys aren't here, but I have very loud music. I just wanted to show people that um, it can be fun. Uh, and with practice, uh, you could you could uh, ride as well as this gentleman. Um, again, uh, it, it's, it's about getting out there and, and getting used to it and practicing. Uh, we often say, you know, uh, go out there and, and lower your pressure in your wheels. Uh, make sure you don't lower it enough that you'll get a pinch flat. But, uh, you know, lower the, the uh, pressure in the wheels and try it. Um, practice in the fall before the winter actually comes. Great. So. Thank you, Ron. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you all our panelists, Ron, Jeff, and Galen. Um, you know, I think we, we've taken our attendees through, um, you know, a multitude of, of understanding on how to cycle in the wintertime, you know, from making sure you have the proper clothing to making sure you're seen, um, stay safe, what the different types of biking, all the way to AAA. And I'm quite sure a lot of people didn't know that AAA offers um, a roadside assistance for bicycling. So we do have some questions and um, let's just start with the questions, okay? So our first question is, do you have a trade-in program at Urban Adventures to upgrade a bike? If not, what do you recommend is the best way to sell an unused bike? Yeah, it's a very common question. So unfortunately at uh, Urban Event Tours, we don't buy used bikes back. The reason for that and uh, for many shops nowadays is uh, in the past, a lot of people, uh, a lot of shops had issues with stolen bikes being sold to them. And there's no good way of tracking that. So as a whole, most bike shops actually do not buy bikes anymore. Your best bet is um, Facebook Marketplace has been a really good um, online um, start to sell bikes as well as just Craigslist. If you have a higher end bike, um, I would then recommend probably Pink Bike as a um, selling site as well. But online is gonna be your best bet. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Jeff, I have another question for you. Um, 
do you carry, I know you talked about um, stock for bikes, you know, is, is very low. So we know that you obviously do carry bikes in stock. So what is, you know, if I come in now and I do place an order, about what is that time frame for me to expect the bike to come in? So just with the way back ordering and supply is going, um, we are actually not taking any special orders right now. Um, but realistically speaking, bikes will start showing up in for inventory around spring of 2021. Um, we are getting bikes here and there throughout the winter, but all the orders um, are really coming in in the spring as the supply chain is catching up and all these bike vendors are now you know, building bikes over the winter. They'll start mm -hmm. showing up for next season. Um, but as for like our shop ourselves, we do have some bikes. Uh, we still have actually plenty of bikes right now um, because we have such a large rental fleet. Um, we have over 100 used bikes and we sell used bikes from our own rental fleet. I'm pretty um, certain that we would have a bike for whatever individual what they're looking for. So okay. And so if you went out to your website, um, you can purchase a bike on your site. Is that correct? You can look at our bikes on our site, but we don't allow online purchases through our website. Just the issues of shipping and all that. So call for availability. Uh, Okay. Um, I'm not sure if everyone heard that response. Um, could you just respond to that question one more time, Jeff? Yeah. Um, so our online website is updated with the bikes we have, but we do not allow um, bikes to be purchased online uh, due to like shipping issues and all that. So okay. if you do have a bike um, in mind, you see on our website, just call in for availability and then you can actually reserve that bike by paying and then we'll just hold that bike and set aside for you. Okay, thank you. And one more question for you. What is a good budget for buying a bike for, you know, if I want it, like, not to spend a lot, but I wanted a good bike, and then what's the basic equipment that I would need for that bike? Yeah, so generally speaking, um, bikes, I'd say a good level and well-respected bike will be, I uh, would start around 500 upwards. You know, we're seeing a lot of online bike um, bikes companies showing up and a lot of you know, department stores carrying certain bike brands where these bikes, although are cheap initially, like in the 100 to three, $400 range, we do see these bikes break a lot quicker. Um, the quality of the riding is a lot worse. So um, with these kind of bikes, you know, you save money up front, but you actually spend more money servicing it throughout its lifetime. So I'd say okay. for modern bikes um, nowadays with like disc brakes and all that, it's something pretty standard. You're probably looking at upwards four to 500 bucks, um, but I would probably stay away from bikes cheaper than that. Um, but there's a real serious quality control from like bikes that are being sold online. Um, another issue with those bikes is that a lot of those bikes get shipped to you and the quality control is pretty low. So as um, someone who maybe who doesn't know how to assemble a bike, they expect you to do that. And we do see a lot of people uh, build their own bikes and they're putting their forks on backwards, their brakes are on inappropriately, and that's, you know, very unsafe to ride. So, um, you know, there's a reason why big brands like Specialized, Giant, um, Trek all work through a dealer and like a retail center. And that is because, you know, they don't believe the general public has the skills you know, to build their bikes and that it should be gone through a professional's hand. Okay, all right, great, thank you. So this next question, you know, Galen or Ron, you can answer that. We really wanna know more about how to stay warm. So talk to us a little bit more about, you know, the, the our attire. I don't know, Ron, you wanna jump in there? Well, Gay, you could jump in. I mean, I, I'm a tailgater from way back, so I know how to layer up, and I and I kind of transitioned in biking using the same techniques, you know. Uh, and you can put it. I I think you have to get a wicking layer first, uh, then some kind of a thermal uh, uh, layer, and then a, a wind blocking layer is is very key. Uh, in most of the times, if you're riding a bike, you're doing 10, 15, 20 miles an hour, depending on on what kind of bike you're riding and what kind of riding you're doing. 
Um, and then, of course, you need that shell for, for, for outer layer for, for um, weatherproofing. Um, Gail, anything else you could add to that? I mean, the key is really just layers and not having cotton be the base. So that's, wool that's is great. Merino wool is even better if you've got the, the budget for it. Um, you can do liner gloves underneath more substantial gloves. Um, literally, when I leave the house, you know, in this season and in the spring season, I'll probably take three different kinds of gloves with me. I'll have the gloves that I might have for riding gloves, and then I might have some liner gloves, and then I might have some waterproof if I'm actually going to be out in the wet. Um, there's other, it really depends on the person, um, but if you're one who gets cold appendages, maybe you have Raynaud node syndrome or some other um, issues about getting, uh, you know, blood to the end of the capillary system, you might think about bringing hand warmers. So for those of you who are skiers, you might be familiar with like the oxide, uh, oxygenated um, iron packets that then create warmth that are basically heat producers. You can slide under your glove. As long as it doesn't change how you can, you know, manipulate the handlebars, the brakes, the shifting, because everything is very important up in the cockpit. So bike specific gear for the gloves, I think is important. Um, then it allows you full mobility. You can even get lobster mitts, which are kind of like the three finger gloves. It's almost like what Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were. Or, um, but the idea there is they, uh, there's basically three different patterns to the glove or components of the glove. And the buddy system keeps your fingers warm. So your fingers actually warm each other, which is also a nice way to do it. So you can do a liner glove and then the lobster mitt glove. And typically that'll get me through those zero degree days. Um, I would recommend bike specific for gloves, mainly because of the traction and the grip and to make sure you have full mobility of shifting and braking and steering. So if you're using ski gloves, that might prohibit you from actually manipulating the shifting. So keep in mind that, but everything else, like whatever I would, I would recommend for winter, uh, I'd also recommend for rain. It's just the layers that go underneath it to create the warmth. But I do think that um, again, you know, warmth can be very personal. So if you're a, a warm blooded person who runs more hot, I would actually be more concerned about overheating. And my concern is if you step out of the house on a cold day and you're already warm enough, you're going to overheat into your ride. And that makes it way more uncomfortable because then you have to deal with moisture and sweat and just kind of that whole breakdown of the mind body connection because you're literally, you just, your, your body's kind of freaking out. Um, it's better to start cold and warm up into your clothing and then to know your limits, like know that if you've been in New England for several seasons, you understand how to get through a winter. But if you're moving here like Jeff from California, you're going to have a learning curve. Um, <laughs> so over bundle, but then be prepared to disrobe. Sounds great. Um, have extra layers in your bag you might not need. That's also great. Um, just, you know, my main concern is as you layer, make sure that you can still do the full mobility of being able to pedal being able to shift, being able to break. And then um, lastly, make sure that it's reflective and bright enough. Because there is this trend about having dark gear, which I don't know why the bike industry sells black gear anymore. Like you saw the man in Helsinki, he was in all black. Like that's not, that might be good if you're like trying to contrast against the snow, but actually I would prefer something reflective and something that's bright. Especially if you're gonna be commuting and it's dark, you really need to be seen out there. So I know that's not the question. I know the question was around warmth, but if you're going to be out in traffic, that is a consideration that your outer layer needs to be as visible as possible. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. There's also, there's safety. also yep. Yeah. There's also a thing called bar mitts. Have you ever seen those? Bar mitts. Uh, for people who, who uh, don't like to have their fingers or dexterity drop down, you can wear a very thin glove and put and get bar mitts for your bicycle, and they're very accessible. I have uh, seen those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can look them up. Just look up bar mitts, and uh, that may be something for each individual. I don't personally use them, but, but uh, I know that a lot of people do. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Ron, I do have a question for you regarding AAA. If I don't have a car, can I still, you know, just do a roadside assistance program for the bike? The answer is yes, but it, it's not any cheaper. <laughs> that's, um, that's fine. Uh, AAA, with AAA, you get several things, and I'm not a big salesman on that end. I'm more on the safety uh, side. Uh, but it's it's got some really great uh, perks. It's got um, uh, uh, protect my ID, 
for free, which is like a $60, $70 value. And, mm -hmm. and that is for the, the membership itself. It's got the bicycle, it's got discounts uh, in, in so many different places, I think uh, T-Mobile, um, uh, all, ki all kinds of things. And again, I'm, I'm not really into the sales part, but for a very small amount of money, you do get a lot back, even if you don't own a car. Uh, and if biking okay. is, is, is your, um, your, your mode of transportation, uh, you would not only get your two bike services, but the other services, since you don't have a car, you probably would be able to increase your bike services. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just have one question, and this one is for you, Galen. You know, if I, I, I want to bike, but, you know, the one at a time, I'm, I'm reluctant to do that. How do I stay in contact with what's going on in the biking world? How do I, you know, keep that advocacy going? Awesome. Thanks for that question. Um, I mean, Mass Bike is a good repository of a lot of stuff that we post on our social media. So we'll try to regionalize it and, and put some big issues, and especially in winter, some of those issues are about uh, snow and ice clearance on the bike paths, um, snow and ice clearance in the bike lanes. So there's, you know, Mass Bike is kind of a catch-all, and we are good about connecting you to other resources. So um, I'm sure my email will be shared after this presentation. You can feel free to get in touch with me directly. Um, but also there's a couple of, uh, you know, if you are a Facebook user, there's some uh, pretty active Boston area Facebook pages. There's the Boston Bike and Ped Advocates group, if you want to join that. Granted, there's a lot of chatter, and Facebook is, you know, convoluted these days, so you might not want to bother with that. Um, there's a group called masspaths.net, and masspaths.net is a website that's crowdsourced where people can um, update the status on the pathway network throughout the state. So if you are thinking about using the Minuteman pathway or the Somerville Community pathway or the Charles River pathway, which are great because you're not in traffic, um, they don't get cleared as well as the streets do. So we basically have this regular group of volunteers who go and update masspaths.net. I believe it's slash snow, uh, but I'll triple check all that before I ask um, Sophia Kelly and Julie to send it out. The idea there is that uh, Mass Bike, though we're a small organization, we have a connection to all the locals. We rely on the locals. Um, so a lot of it is, you know, where are you calling from? Where are you tuning in from? And I would connect you with your local either bike and pet advocacy group. It could be formal through the city and the town. Um, it could be an informal one. Um, there could be both a formal and an informal one like Cambridge because it's Cambridge and they have both. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of uh, probably a lot of infrastructure projects that will be really interesting for you that you might not even know about, which is where I would love to have you plug in as well. So wherever you're calling from, there's going to be something that okay. will be in terms of bike advocacy. And with that, I think massbike.org. Um, and from there, I should also say we have some resources on our page for you to check out too. We're working on our regionalization of ways to connect stuff. So that's still in the works. So we have a great resources tab about places to ride, which connects okay. to a map of all of the bike lanes and all of the off-road pathways throughout the whole state. Um, and some other resources about if you're in a crash, um, we have a resources page about bike shops that are open during COVID, which is not so much of a concern these days, but was a concern back in March. So I'd also recommend pointing you to your local bike shop. So okay. uh, you know, wherever you are, there's got to be a local bike shop there. If you're in Boston, check in with Jeff, um, or even not in Boston, check in with Jeff, because they'll have um, a lot of the ears on the ground. Okay. That's, uh, that's also a really good way to go. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you guys, you know, for answering those questions. You know, I do want to check, do a plug for eCommuter because Galen mentioned that um, an eCommuter is a way that, you know, it's a resource database for you to go in and find the best bike path, the safest bike path, Bike Buddy. Um, it, it offers walking. Um, so, you know, I do want to direct the audience to go in and just play around with eCommuter.org and see what's in there for, for you. Okay, turn it back over to you, Julie. Thank you, thank you. To all of our presenters, Jeff, Gail, and Ron, thank you so much. As you can see on the screen now, all of their contact information is on there. You will also receive an email with the recording and it will also have their, uh, uh, excuse me, contact information on there. So we hope this gave you the confidence to bike when it does snow um, the next seven days. Definitely get out there and bike because it's going to be beautiful. Um, you'll also have, if you do have questions or comments, please reply to the email that you receive and your commuter services rep will get back in touch with you. So there'll also be a 
a quick survey for you to complete um, and you can get in touch with us at any time. So thank you to our presenters. Thank you to our attendees and um, keep biking. Bye guys. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day.